on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Mike Konzel. He is a uh, fellow at the Roosevelt Institute and uh, also a uh, frequent contributor to the Washington Post, to Bloomberg, I mean, uh, everywhere. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so let's let's start with um, a couple of days ago was the uh, the five year anniversary of uh, Lehman Brothers going down in flames, and um, the uh, let's talk about uh, you know uh, your piece what we get wrong when we talk about the financial crisis, and then we will move forward in time uh, to discuss uh, this week's uh, uh, news. Uh, coming out of the Fed and surrounding the Fed. But so what is it? I mean, when what's wrong with people over associating, I guess, the financial crisis with the Lehman bankruptcy? Sure. So, I mean, obviously, the, the crisis that really culminated in late 2008 with the bailouts and Lehman Brothers collapsing and a lot of genuine panic, which was matched with, you know, monthly job losses of almost a million jobs a month. Um, when we think of the crisis that way, and that is like a super legitimate crisis that really freaked out the markets, freaked out people with jobs, freaked out businesses, it, it limits where we're drawing what reforms need to take place, and it limits how we understand what actually happened. Um, I bring it up because I watch a lot of stuff with financial reform, and then people are starting to make arguments that that crisis in 2008 would be a lot more manageable now. And maybe that's true. We can talk about that if that's interesting. We could probably make sure Lehman didn't collapse in such a, a mess. We could probably do some stuff to AIG that would have not been such a crony bailout. But what we, would, what we haven't done is dealt with the underlying mortgage crisis that really generated all that. I mean, the real pr reason that all that panic happened is because all these subprime loans, all these really bad loans made by Wall Street collapsed. We're still living through that now. And the other crisis is really just like a crisis of legitimacy. I mean, even though we could possibly do stuff about the 2008 crisis, if it was to happen again, we don't have a sense that Wall Street's like legitimately working for the real economy. And that it's all not just kind of a scam to enrich the 1% at everyone else's expense. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, part of, um, uh, part of this is, is, is because the, the, the root of the problem, as you say, sort of it started uh, with uh, mortgages. It just sort of mushroomed out. And, and that, the, 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 the concept that it could have mushroomed out in that way was part of the problem. Right, absolutely. So, and, and when you look at going forward, like, well, what needs to be done? You know, what, what are our serious problems? Um, you know, that the real crisis actually, I mean, it did originate from bad mortgages. People weren't sure what these mortgages were worth because they were all sliced and diced and everyone was clearly lying to each other. And that comes from just actual bad behavior by Wall Street. I mean, it's been so well documented over the past couple of years. There's tons of things you could read about it um, or your audience could read about it. Um, you know, just the fact that Wall Street was clearly going out and making loans that they know could not be paid back. They were selling instruments that they were hoping would fail because they took insurance out on them. Um, you know, that kind of pure bad behavior, that's a set of cultural norms and a set of the way institutions view themselves. It's really difficult to change with regulation. And that's ultimately what will be needed going forward. Now, uh, all right, so let's, let's I mean, you, you talk about <clears throat> three different uh, uh, crises that, that, that basically made up that 2008. And let's, let's go through each one of them. Uh, and and the, the, the first is the, the failing firms. And, and just, you know, so when we're talking about Lehman Brothers, uh, but why did Lehman Brothers go bankrupt? So Lehman Brothers went bankrupt because um, its short-term creditors would not lend to it anymore. So the way it kept its business afloat is it would go out and borrow money. The people who would lend it money to keep it afloat, often like on a daily basis or a weekly basis, got very nervous that the, the fundamental business it was engaged in, which was slicing and dicing bad mortgages, wasn't sound, and that was a very correct thing to think. Uh, and so they wouldn't lend to it. And so they, you know, it, it looked a lot like a banking run. If you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, if you've thought about banks before FDIC, it looked a lot like that. People got nervous about this thing that looked and acted like a bank, though it wasn't a bank in the legal sense, but it was still a bank in the sense that it borrowed money and lent it out. And people got nervous and, and did a run on it. So we, we know from the FDIC, we know from banking regulation how to, how to approach that subject. And it's, it's not a trivial subject, and I don't want to downplay that crisis at all, but we, we kind of understand the, the scope of what needs to be done in that space. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that collapsed in 2008, but the other big one was AIG. Right. And this, um, you know, um, 
Larry, you know, the, the AIG famously, um, we, the government took it over, covered its uh, costs, uh, paid out bonuses that uh, Tim Geithner and Larry Summers did not fight against. I mean, it was a total mess. It was very, it was very upsetting to people for very good reasons. Um, the, the instrument that they were trading, something called the credit default swap, which is kind of like an insurance on credit, um, was prone for abuse and was prone for these kind of positions where people made giant bets that they couldn't cover. And if it worked out, they won a bunch of money. If it didn't work out, they just disappeared. Um, that's, that's exactly what we saw there. We think that there's a lot more progress. There's a man named Gary Gensler at an agency called the CFTC, which is working very hard against both bank regulator, against both the banks and the Treasury at this point to push to make those kind of instruments much more transparent, much more collateralized, and would hopefully take a lot of that brunt off of that. So, And the CFTC, and we should say, is just the, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, um, which, which theoretically regulates, uh, or I guess not theoretically, uh, regulates these sort of subsidiary financial uh, products. Right. So, so when we look at like the real crisis, crisis, or when we look at the crisis as people understand it, some some major problems step out, and it's not easy to fix them. But conceptually, it's easy to fix them. Like we understand what went wrong. The other stuff is much harder to understand what went wrong. All right. Well, I want us to stay with Lehman Brothers for a second because you know I'm sort of you know so here you have creditors sensing that there's a problem, right? I mean, uh, and in exacerbate in bringing this problem to a head. What, why was it that the, the, if the creditors were aware that this was a problem, why was there no sort of action by regulatory agencies? I mean, you know, what comes to mind to me is that I knew a guy at uh, Bear Stearns, uh, and I had gone to visit him uh, literally, I think, the week that they padlocked the doors there. And this was on a Monday. I think they padlocked the doors on a Thursday. And I had read that they had opened up the discount window for, for Bear Stearns uh, with, with only a, sort of a, a, a rudimentary understanding of what that meant. But I was reading that some people thought this indicated a real problem. And this guy, you know, he wasn't uh, hugely placed, but he was a vice president. And I said, hey, you got all the swag here. My, should I take some of this? Because I'm reading things that you guys are in big trouble. And he says, no, nah, no, nah, I just... I just bought the credit from, uh, you know, uh, 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 from a Latin American country, and I went down the hallway, and they said, no problem, and they would have never said that's okay if we didn't have the cash uh, to do it. <laughs> and three days later, <laughs> you couldn't get into his office. And uh, so, I mean, how is it that, the, was there an attempt by, I mean, w was the Fed at this point, I mean, the Fed obviously was aware that, uh, uh, you know, there was a problem and they're opening up this uh, window for, for, for Bear Stearns, but was there more that they could have done in those months over the course of the summer leading up to September uh, without it having to come to such a sort of like a, an acute um, uh, sort of catastrophic failure? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a tough call. Um, you know, it depends on a lot of things. They, they could, in theory, have tried to push Congress to pass something that would have given them authority to take over Lehman. Uh, and the, they could have tried to push the law and said that they and claimed that they had the ability to put something like Lehman in the resolution. Um, I, I think that it, it's tough given the, 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 the time frame that they're dealing with. The biggest thing you see in retrospect and stuff that the stuff we – kind of had to come out through courts and depositions and investigations is that um, things like um, the New York Fed, for instance, was allowing Lehman to kind of fake its stress tests. Um, so like they, 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 you know, this is actually very classic. Uh, Lehman Brothers took a stress test uh, and it failed. And the stress test for your audience is just like, it says, if things get bad, will your bank be okay? Um, it's a pretty normal process. A lot of different kind of firms do these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, they took it again under a modified version, and they still failed. Then there's the second modified version, which they passed. And so they're like, look, it passed. It's fine. So the general sense you get is that they were trying to kick the can and hope something happened that would fix it. Um, so a lot of, you know, in, you know, a lot of, def you know, a lot of just ignoring the actual problem. Do you think um, there's a, so do you think I, that there's a, a greater understanding that, you know, um, the value of stress tests go way down if you have to keep essentially, uh, making them less stressful, uh, until somebody passes? I mean, is that, is there, is there any transparency in that process? Because that seems to be very problematic. There's no real value in taking, um, 
you know, in, uh, in, in giving someone an exam and they fail and you say, you know what the answer to this is, we need an easier exam. Yeah, and I mean, this was a, this was, this came up a lot with Larry Summers, who is being uh, who is possibly a nominee for the Federal Reserve. Um, the big thing regulators have power-wise is the ability to kind of exempt or defer requirements and regulations. So you see a lot of you know a lot of firms that have shaky business lines or shaky things going on. They just get their their enforcement deferred, right? So it's like it's like any other part of the government where it's you know it's pretty shady, where it's you know they 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 pick and choose who has to follow the rules. Now, there's a bunch of stuff in Dodd-Frank to try to make that tighter, um, and the stress tests coming out the door right now uh, are much better but, and, and marginally more transparent. The question is whether or not that will keep in five or ten years, and, and right. that's, that's what really worries a lot of people. All right, let's go on to the second crisis, which was the housing crisis. The, the, what were the factors that created this? I mean, clearly we had, and, and we've spoken quite a bit on this program, about the uh, the failure of mortgage originators to um, both have skin in the game and essentially do their job, which was a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that the people they're loaning the money to um, have at least a, a high likelihood of being able to pay it back. Exactly. So um, the, the thing you hear a lot, and I think I mentioned in the piece, is the... Um, uh, but, Oh, I forgot the exact phrase, but it's, it's basically like by the time this all collapses, we'll be gone. Right. Um, it was the kind of motto uh, and the kind of mindset of a lot, the way a lot of these mortgages and originators work, which is to say that they understood that they were doing stuff that was really shady and really shaky. Um, but by the time all that stuff fell apart, they would have gotten their bonuses. They would have made a lot of money, millions of dollars. Um, and that's at the lowest end. Um, and then they could be gone. And if, and if everything collapsed, they would be holding no real bag or no real trouble. Um, so by the time you get to 2006, 2007, you have a sizable number of mortgages coming out the door that have never made a payment. So it's almost certainly clearly fraud on both ends because like, or there's just no way that these, there's no way the, the mortgage originators, people who are making the mortgages that went into these mortgage-backed securities, which were then sliced and diced out into Wall Street, were making loans in good faith. Now, they'll tell you that the demand was so high and the 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 um the idea that you know they they did not want to know certain things was coming from from Wall Street who wanted these mortgages to be made so you know when you fundamentally look at this this is a crisis of, of mortgage origination and it should make us really doubt the ability of Wall Street to do its fundamental job I mean the reason it's supposed to be paid so much money and it gets all this talent and we're told to respect it so much and let it dictate you know our schools and all this other stuff is because they can allocate capital in such a good way but when you look at it, th this was their fundamental job and it was fundamentally broken I mean through and through and it made a lot of bad investments it ruined a lot of capital that people have worked hard to save and it's devastated neighborhoods I mean it's a real major failure and then it's still ongoing I mean we see events in Richmond yeah. California where they're trying to eminent domain mortgages there's still um, roughly a quarter of all more of uh, homes with a mortgage are underwater uh, it's still holding back the economic recovery I mean th that mortgage crisis was was a crisis back then but it's still a crisis right now now the uh, the 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 housing crisis was 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 two part. I mean, it was it was driven in some respects by the um, the you know what is beyond easy credit. I guess um, it was it, it seemed to me it was also driven even by uh, the maestro saying like, look, you know, folks would be silly to get a thirty year mortgage uh, when you've got all these really innovative products that will allow you to get into a house today. I mean, it was. Um, uh, he was uh, uh, basically telling people, like, you know, here's the here's the crack pipe. There's no, you know, you're gonna feel really good about this for a couple of weeks. Um, but so, w w I mean, what do we know about, you know, how w what drove this housing bubble, and you know, how do we avoid this happening? Again, that I mean, I guess part of it is is to make sure that the loans are legit as they're being um, as they're being made. Um, but, but I mean, you know, we're we're stuck in this sort of conundrum of of wanting housing to rebound, but to, to I guess to do so in a more sort of measured way. Right. So so there's a lot of theories about why 
why the housing bubble happened the way it did. And a lot of them have to do with, um, for instance, a global savings glut or the idea that a lot of, especially Asian countries, were saving a lot of money, perhaps because the IMF put them through major austerity in the 90s. Uh, so, then, so they were saving so much money and had to go somewhere, and so it went to the United States. Um, crucially, I mean, it's, it's still important to remember that, like, that should have been a boom for us. It should have allowed us to do things like reinvent the energy industry or build mass transit or, like, or it should have had – ideally, Wall Street and the private sector should have put that to really good use. Uh, but in part because they had all this technology to rip people off of housing, in part, and I think this is a esoteric theory, a part because when that happened, there's also WorldCom and Enron and GE Capital, and a lot of people were really scared that corporate <laughs> corporate numbers were entirely juked, and there's all these like real worries about um, kind of corporate crime and the idea that you know all these investments were really shady and manipulated. So, you know, the fact that Wall Street could not put that money to use is still a major problem. Now, for housing specifically, you see this is actually a major battle going on right now. Um, Dodd-Frank put in some parts of a, a better housing market, particularly the CFP, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which is designed to kind of weed out uh, mortgage abuse. It con consolidates some other regulators. Um, but it still ultimately hasn't decided about what role the government will play in the housing market, either through what's going to happen with government insurance of mortgages through the GSEs, whether or not we're going to try to do this private label securitization thing, whether or not we're going to kind of keep the slice and dice mortgage model and try to make it safer, or we're going to do something different. And that's actively ongoing right now. I mean, I, th this may be a little bit New York-centric, but uh, the New York, and, and I've heard this actually also of Boston, I imagine it's happening in a couple of cities, the the, the real estate market is going insane. And um, you know, I've heard different theories that people are, are trying to get in before interest rates rise. I've also heard that there's so much foreign money coming in. Uh, it is eating up the housing market. Uh, there were less housing starts coming out of the, um, uh, the financial crisis. So the inventory is low relative to, uh, I guess, the, the, the demand. Um, what, you know, are, is this, are we going to see something, you know, it, it's obviously not what we saw necessarily, I think, leading up to the years of 2008, but are we going to see, is this, a, is this another problem in the making? So, um, New York is kind of its own city in so many ways. So it, it's tough to, to put that, uh, it, it's useful to put that aside for a second, um, in general, as of early this summer, the last time I saw very good numbers on this, the housing recovery is happening the most where the housing bust was the most severest. So places like California, Arizona, Florida, um, everywhere but Detroit, I suppose. Um, you know, everywhere where housing value really fell, it's having the, a quicker recovery. Um, so that's good in the sense that um, you want some parity recovery, right? You want you want you know, like Vegas and Nevada, for instance, are having housing prices go up again after they really bottom out in 2010, 2011. Now, some urban cores uh, that are very, you know, driven by inequality, global and local, driven by lack of space. I mean, there's only, only so much space in New York, so either we build more or we do something else. Um, you know, place like San Francisco, for instance, is another one that's had you know, double-digit growth, or I'm sorry, you know, like huge growth in these areas that are populated by these kind of you know Facebooks and um, mm -hmm. Googles and, and places, and you know those those are issues for both you know actual housing, they're issues for actual public, private, and democracy. You see a lot of like private um, mass transit showing up in the Bay Area to like handle all kinds of Google workers. So I, I, I think you know there's there's a couple different issues, but the the in terms of the actual increase in housing as a whole, it seems well spaced out to balance out the problems of the crisis. Okay. And so, all right, so let's, let's I mean, uh, let's uh, move on uh, to um, uh, the, I guess, the, earlier this week, Larry Summers uh, announced that he is, um, uh, he's no longer a candidate for uh, the Fed chair. And by all accounts, he seemed to have been uh, the administration's uh, first, first, uh, you know, the uh, he was on their bucket list. I guess he was the the, the top of the list in terms of, of Fed chair. Um, the, there's a lot of implications to this. It seems to me, not the least of which uh, Fed policy, but also in terms of of what's happening within. 
uh, the, I guess at the very least, the, the, the Democratic left, if you will. Um, just uh, give us a rundown of, of just what happened and what, what you think the implications are, because I mean, you wrote that you, you see this as a win for the country. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I wrote something for Al Jazeera America um, that, that had that as the title. Um, so the Federal Reserve uh, is, you know, kind of mind-numbingly complex, but it's actually super important for how the economy evolves. And it does two big things. It sets monetary policy, which we believe even in a crisis sets the short-term economy. It, it steers the short-term economy. So, it, you know, it can make it go a little bit faster, a little bit slower, depending on how heated the economy as a whole. The other thing it does is that it's a very important banking regulator. It essentially sets the, the, the practical regulation for so many parts of the financial industry, especially the, the stuff consumers deal with, like credit cards, uh, and then also the bigger stuff, like what Wall Street deals with, like leverage for investment banks. Um, Larry Summers was nominated, and Larry Summers someone who has a very long, very idiosyncratic history in democratic politics. Um, you know, a lot of liberals... Um, don't like him from the 1990s, where he was a big, you know, he's a proponent of saying, you know, he was a very provocative figure in a very neoliberal and kind of centrist economics way. Um, and crucially, he was a very big proponent of deregulating the financial sector in the 1990s. Now, a lot of people were at that time, uh, but he was very aggressive with it. And he was very aggressive with, um, he was very instrumental in overturning Glass-Steagall. Crucially, he was very um, instrumental in keeping derivatives from being regulated when um, the CFTC, which we brought up before, tried to, tried to investigate whether or not they could and should do such a thing. He, he shut down a woman named Brooksley Bourne, who's a very talented lawyer, uh, and, and she essentially had to lead public life. Uh, at least until the crisis happened. Uh, and as late as 2005, he was attacking the idea that all this mortgage financial engineering stuff could be making the system more risky rather than less. So a lot of people uh, in liberal politics who are very nervous about the way financial reform is going and about the democratic relationship with Wall Street, uh, period, um, saw this as a big problem because Larry Summers has never been very vocal about what Fed policy needs to be, and he has a long history of Wall Street that makes people very nervous. And, and so uh, essentially what happened is there was strong pushback uh, from uh, activists, from uh, writers, I mean, uh, including yourself. Um, and this uh, it, and there also seemed to be at least um, uh, very uh, fertile, I guess, grounds within uh, Democrats in the Senate anyway uh, that would be um, – uh, very amenable to the message that Larry Summers is wrong. I mean, uh, the Noam Schreiber had a piece. Uh, Schreiber had a piece uh, where I guess in in 2009, John Kerry was in a room uh, asking why in the hell should we listen to Larry Summers anyway? Um, but uh, so essentially, he went around. He surveyed. He got the took the temperature of uh, about four or five senators on the uh, on the banking committee. And they said, no way. What, what are the implications? I mean, what does this say? There's been, there's been a, a decent amount made of this, and, and, and you make this case, uh, at least to a certain extent in your piece, that this represents uh, perhaps a shift in the way that uh, in, in, within democratic politics from – a little bit more towards the populist or a shift towards populism versus sort of the neoliberal. Uh, is, that, is that accurate? So, I mean, there's two dimensions. One is that, I mean, through, through the Obama administration, liberals have always had a very weird way, a weird situation about how to challenge the administration, given that conservatives are so reactionary at this point. I mean, even even right-wing people right now are very uncomfortable with where the party, the Republican Party is right now. Um, so there's a lot of things like, well, you know, we want stronger Obamacare, but would we sabotage it? No, probably right. not. Um, you know, we wanted a larger stimulus, but something is better than nothing. And it's been this weird series of balances and trade-offs. Um, one thing that is noteworthy is that where liberals seem to be much more aggressive right now is on stuff where the administration – and then since – especially since 2010, and this, you know, especially since the Senate went into kind of this – um, you know, process lockdown in 2009, um, there's been a big thing about, you know, what can Obama do with a dysfunctional Congress? So where liberals have really been pushing lately uh, has been on stuff where the executive branch has a lot of power. 
uh, by itself without having necessarily to go to Congress, which is, for instance, the national security state, foreign policy with Syria, and now uh, the nominees it chooses to put forward policy, especially nominees for stuff where there's usually a lot of deference, like you know a Federal Reserve chair. Um, that's a really important and I think interesting place, in part because a lot of the stuff about, well, what can you do, the Senate's so broken, falls, falls away as an argument. Mm -hmm. And separately, I mean, the places, those places are real problematic for liberals and the Obama administration. National security, this very hawkish kind of centrist democratic uh, economic policymakers. Um, I think that's where, the, post Obama, that's what, what the Democratic Party is going, and liberals are going to need to figure out what they're going to do with. And this is a good place for it to start, I feel. This group of um, really liberal and I think really smart and very strong senators in the banking committee, which include Merkley, Brown, and uh, Warren. Yeah, and, 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 and part of this also seems to be sort of like a backlash at the, at the, from the frustration. I mean, the Obama administration had a lot of latitude in the way that they dealt with um, the the uh, the the mortgage crisis, the financial crisis, in terms of of uh, of going uh, of both like you could have bailed out the actual mortgage holders uh, rather than the banks in to some d degree. You could have required uh, more accountability, and you know uh, President Obama, I guess, as late as uh, 2012, had set up a a, a new special. Blue Ribbon Committee investigative body, um, which uh, A.G. Schneiderman was part of, that uh, was was touted as is really going to be uh, holding people to account, and that turned into nothing, as far as I can tell. Um, so some of this is, is is a bit of a backlash, and it, it it's it, it's fascinating to see. And let me ask you this: in terms of it was announced this week. Well, I, I, let's just also turn to Janet Yellen because she appears now. Uh, to be the uh, the most likely uh, appointee or nominee, I should say, um, and and she also it was reported this week was also in favor of of repealing Glass Steagall uh, back in the '90s. Where wh give us a sense of like why Yellen is better than Summers? I mean, we know why Summers is bad, but why is Yellen necessarily better than Summers? So I, I think there's two dimensions, right? Um, one is, yeah, so Zach Carter at the Huffington Post reported that um, Yellen, um, you know, did all this stuff. The very new Democrat 90s, right? So you know, Glass repeal Glass Steagall, NAFTA, mess around with Social Security in aggressive ways. Um, there's two reasons why I think it's Yellen is still a much superior candidate. One is that for financial reform, you, you particularly want someone who will do no harm. Um, you know, ideally, we'd like someone who would be a, 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 an asset but not being a liability is its own kind of asset. So in so much as that she would let people who we trust and who we think are doing good work, like um, Governor Torello at the Federal Reserve, Gary Gensler at CFTC, the CFTB, um, that's, that, and, and so much as she's not going to get in their way, uh, I think that's, a, that's actually really important. So, she's not, she, it, so she's not hostile to the idea of, uh, of, of regulation of the financial industry in the way that Summers may be. Yeah, I mean, one of the big things, and you, you really see this with Alan Greenspan, uh, was that Alan Greenspan would show up and say, hey, guess what, we're not going to investigate subprime mortgage abuses at all. And then people who really wanted to do that were blocked because that was the most powerful person, and you couldn't really go against them in that way. Um, all indications are Yellen would be much more hands-off in that space, which I think would be good because I think the people, there are people we trust in, in some positions who are still doing good and could be doing better. Um, and, and Larry Summers is someone who strikes everyone as would be much more skeptical about pushing the envelope on the financial system. And another thing is like it's all going to be done at the margins, like you know someone pushing a little bit further than they would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And Summers gives off the impression, and he has not worked at all with with activist groups, with anyone else, to say at the margins he would be willing to push a little bit harder. So that, and he's very active in democratic politics. So it was a very clear signal that. Financial reform would take a big step back if he was put in charge there. And it also seems uh, the thing that people have talked about with Yellen is that she seems to embrace the concept of full employment uh, in a way that Larry Summers hasn't either. Just uh, can you expand on that? Sure. So in, in 2009, the Fed, um, just to summarize in a very quick way, the Fed, the normal stuff the Fed did to try to stabilize the economy in the short term, it essentially did all of it and it couldn't stabilize the economy. So, um, you, know, un you know, it did everything it could. It put interest rates to zero in late 2008, and unemployment still went up to 10%. So in 
So the question is, can the Fed do other things with its legal powers on how much of it can it do? And this is where you get QE3. This is where you get things like the ta- whether or not to do the taper, which came up this week. Um, you get all these kind of debates about what are the other powers the Fed has and how useful are they. Um, Yellen is someone who thinks they're actually pretty useful and there's a lot of them and they should try all of them and they should do them until unemployment is very low, which is, as an institution, all liberals should want from it. I mean, that, that is very important. Um, Yellen has talked a lot. I, I, I don't want to oversell her on this mm-hmm. because she still has continuity with the Bernanke Fed. I think someone like Christina Romer, for instance, who was with the Obama administration and has since left, um, has been much more vocal in a way that I think would be better uh, in terms of, of how much more aggressive that they could be. But Larry Summers has actually been incredibly um, divorced from this debate. Um, he's someone who writes about everything and writes about everything in very public forms. But crucially, it was very difficult to understand if he thought that the Fed should be doing more. And he gave some indications that things like, like maybe the Fed should pull back a little bit because you don't want to be too risky in getting unemployment down. I think that's really dangerous because what the Fed does next will determine how the economy evolves over the next decade. I think it will determine whether or not unemployment levels out, how quickly unemployment gets low, and then how low it gets. And Yellen is someone who's very clearly, what, what I hate the term dovish, but someone who's an unemployment hawk, someone who takes it very seriously, where summers always seem very vague and, and indifferent. And the fact that people had to guess about that made it such a liability that we really didn't take a chance with it. So, all right, so th- this week uh, the Fed uh, surprised people a bit uh, because they had indicated that they were going to taper. And when we say taper, basically pull back a little bit from uh, their quantitative easing. Just tell us, uh, you know, just give us a, um, uh, a brief recap of what quantitative easing is and um, what it meant to taper and, and why they, d- they didn't taper the, the quantitative easing. Sure. So in, in this, so the, the Fed was very silent throughout 2011 and 2012 in terms of trying to get unemployment down. Then it, a bunch of arguments came up, and they were put under a lot of political pressure. And it was actually a big win for people who were arguing for the unemployed that in December of last year, the Fed said, we're going to keep, on, we're going to keep interest rates low until unemployment is lower, actually 6.5%, which was a way of trying to give guidance to the market and trying to commit themselves to being very aggressive. Um, the other thing they did is that they said they were going to buy um, $85 billion a month in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities to try to push interest rates in such a way that to get investment to boom with that. So they thought these two things together, guidance and purchases are the two relevant categories here, would help, would help stimulate the economy. Now, of course, in 2013, we had a massive wave of austerity. Uh, we had the sequester. We had the fiscal cliff. Um, we had payroll taxes go up. It was a huge unforced error, which I think really caused a lot of damage to the economy, though it has not put us back in a recession. Um, and so, but, but that did not happen right away. And so starting around March, people started to think the economy was doing better than, it, than they had expected. So they started to talk about pulling back on the purchases. And they thought that they could be clever and say, well, the guidance is in place. We've already told people what we're going to keep interest rates over the next couple of years. We don't think these purchases are doing very much, so we're going to start to pull them back. We're not going to stop them, but we're going to taper them back, which is where the term comes from. And they, they, they gave some hints to that in June, and interest rates went up. Um, it was seen as very contractionary for the economy, that the economy slowed down a bit from it. And so they're clearly trying to reverse that, that action. They, I think they didn't expect it to happen that way, but it did. And then separately, all the shenanigans going on in Congress where the Republicans seem hell-bent on just destroying the country to stop people from getting health care and possibly really shutting down the government or defaulting on the debt has made the Fed even more worried because those things will really do economic damage and the Fed has to – the Fed doesn't want to contract at the same time the federal government goes into chaos. So people have to understand that you have uh, uh, the monetary policy coming from the Fed and the fiscal policy essentially coming from – uh, broad strokes here from from Congress, and Congress is sort of going in the wrong direction, and so uh, people are looking to the Fed to sort of to get creative with monetary policy to make up what we really need from the fiscal side. Let, let me ask you this: Do, when 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 the Fed when the when, when the board of uh, when when the, when the Fed hears that uh, um, Larry Summers is gone. Does that affect the individual sort of uh, members of the Fed and say, you know, we're getting a very strong indication that the that we really need to 
um, uh, be more serious about our mandate to to get employment going and not so worried about inflation, particularly when uh, we have not even gotten to our target uh, in terms of inflation. Does that impact them yep. at all? I mean, I, or is that just coincidental? It's a good question. Um, so back in 2010 and 2011, I think you saw a lot more Fed governors very um, – in, I don't want to say well, indifferent to unemployment. People who thought that you know there's too much risk at getting unemployment down too quickly. So I, I, what I thought was a lot of really obviously conservative arguments that you know Obamacare had made it so that eight percent unemployment would would go on forever and so on and so forth. Those arguments are are really dead in the water. They're dead going back to certainly the Reinhard Rogoff stuff. Uh, but the arguments for austerity and the arguments that our economy just sucks and we should deal with it have really fallen by the wayside. What I think is really active in the Fed right now is the idea so, – so, for instance, there's only one dissenting vote from, the, from keeping the taper going, which was a big surprise. I mean, people were legitimately surprised at that being so aggressive, um, and there's only one dissenting vote for it. So what – what I would point out is that I think the big issue is I think members of the Fed aren't sure what powers they have that are useful for getting unemployment down at this point, uh, which is why someone like Yellen, who clearly thinks they do and wants to try, I think is very important. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, Mike Hansel, uh fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it um, uh, helping us uh, work our way through this stuff. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me on.